patents are frequently misunderstood. They are granted by national governments and give limited monopoly-like powers to their owners for a limited period of time, generally 20 years from the date of filing. However, in my experience, listening to and reading popular coverage on patents, what a particular patent covers and how infringement is determined appears lost to many. In my experience, patents are frequently confused with trademarks and copyrights. Each protects a different type of intellectual property, and what constitutes infringement is quite different. Dropping the actual legal definitions, patents cover technical inventions, how to do something that wasn't done before, or doing something that is done, but doing it faster, cheaper, or better. Copyrights protect artistic expression, music, books, and movies, and the like. Trademarks designate the source of origin for goods or services. Companies spend a lot of money building up brand identification, and consumers rely on brands when making purchases. Many people know copyright and trademark infringement because, well, they actually do it. When someone gets a free copy of a software or a song, they're looking for an exact copy, which is not surprisingly a copyright infringement. When someone buys a fake Louis Vuitton bag, they're purposefully not buying from the actual source and creating an impression that they did. It's confusingly similar, as the law might say, and it is so on purpose. That's not how patent infringement works. Most people, indeed most companies, have no idea how many patents they infringe. And, unlike a college kid loading up their handheld device with free music and dropping in a knockoff Louis Vuitton bag, most companies do not set out to infringe patents. Patents are different because they have what are called claims. The only way to figure out if a patent is infringed is to read the claims and to compare it to a device. That's not easy in many cases. Most people have no idea how their cell phone actually works. If you don't know how a device works, you can't determine infringement whether you read the claim or not. Legally, patent infringement analysis is loaded with special rules and exceptions, which change relatively frequently as new cases are decided. That's how patent attorneys make their money. However, anyone can get pretty close to understanding what is or is not infringed or covered by a patent by simply learning how to read a patent claim. Whether you're seeking a patent yourself or are concerned someone will assert one against you, it's worth taking a moment to understand how the analysis is done. Let's do it. Let's start with a simple mechanical patent. Here's a patent that I've used as an example for many years and offer my apologies to the inventor and their attorney. I start with a copy of the patent. I use paper copies and it generally works well for the reasons that you'll see. Download a copy of the patent and follow along. This patent has to do with a bottle opener. One of the first things people are surprised about when they learn about patents is how easy it is to get one. Patents are granted for relatively simple improvements over what has been done before. That has always been a source of controversy and remains so today. One need not find a cure for cancer to get a patent. Despite assertions otherwise, all countries issue patents on relatively simple improvements, not just the United States. When I look at a new patent, I physically separate the patent into four sections. The front page, the drawings, the description, and the claims. I first read the claims. Again, this is what the patent covers and what is used to determine infringement. The claims are always at the back of the patent. There are two types of patent claims, independent and dependent. For now, all you care about are the independent claims. Those are all the claims that do not start with a word such as the invention of claim one, wherein. Claim one is always an independent claim, so start there. To infringe a patent, an accused device has to have each element found in the claim. It can have more features, but it has to have at least all the elements found in the independent claim. If it doesn't, the patent claim is not infringed and no one owes anyone any money. Designing around is the process of designing a device that is missing at least one element of a patent claim. The first step in reading a claim is to identify the various words or phrases used in the claim. Frequently, the terms used in the claim will not be common or may have a legal meaning that is somewhat different from what one gets from the first reading. After you read the claim, go through the remaining portions of the patent to see how the terms are used. The phrases used in the claim will be found in what's called the detailed description of the patent. It's relatively easy to download the text of a patent from the Patent and Trademark Office and use a word processor to find where the words or phrases are found in the detailed description of the patent. Don't get hung up on the detailed description at this point. It's written by attorneys for very specific legal reasons. In that sense, it's like a deed to a piece of property, but it makes for very bad reading. Using the claim and the detailed description, I label the drawings. Returning to claim one of the patent, the first part of every claim is called the preamble and sets up the general field of the invention. In this case, the preamble reads, a bottle opening device 
for wearing on a wrist and a hand, and for removing a bottle cap from a bottle. So we know that it's not an aircraft engine or a new carburetor. The actual claim elements begin after the colon punctuation mark by convention. Have a quick scan of the language. This is exactly why patent infringement analysis is different from copyright or trademark infringement. We're going to have to figure out what these words mean and whether an accused device has them. Visually, one can see that there are at least three major elements to the claim, the base, the wristband, and the hollow circular member. Let's find the base in the description and in the figures. The numbers in the figures correspond to the numbers in the written description. Scanning the written description, we find that the term base is item 12. and We can label that in the figures. The next big element is the wristband. That's easy to find. It's item 14. The next element is typical of patent claims. It's a slightly unusual phrasing, a hollow circular member. Scanning the written description, we find that the term circular member is item 16, and it says it's hollow. Now that the big claim elements are labeled, we can go deeper and label the other elements. Returning to the base, the base is claimed as having a top surface, a bottom surface, and a pair of opposite ends configured to receive a wristband. Reading through the detailed description, there are two issues. The first is that the top surface is identified as item 34 in one place. However, item 34 is also referred to as a front surface in another. Second, there is no use of the term bottom surface in the description. Instead, the term rear surface is used. As such, there is technically no identification of what the claim bottom surface is. Not using the same words in the claim and the written description is an unfortunate error when the patent claim was written. While most people would understand that these are the same, in a more complicated patent, a potential infringer might be able to argue that the claim calls for something that was never described in the patent. That could invalidate the claim. That's the kind of stuff patent attorneys argue about when big money might change hands in an infringement case. Continuing, the base is also required to have opposite ends configured to receive a wristband. These are the ends where the pins 18 are found. Note again that the term opposite ends is not used in the written description. The next claim element describes a wristband, which at first appears pretty standard. Nonetheless, there are a few things that the wristband needs to have. It needs a first and second end, where the first end is attached to one of said ends of said base, and said second end attached to the other of said ends of said base. And in particular, this element will become important later, said wristband for encircling a user's wrist. That's shown in figure one. The next major claim element is the hollow circular member corresponding to item 16, the circular member first noted at column five, line two. The hollow circular member needs to extend upward from said top surface of said base and it has to have a plurality of ridges and grooves dimensioned and configured for engaging ridges and grooves of a bottle cap. The hollow circular member also has to have a groove radius and a ridge radius. Here, the attorney is defining something that any circle with interior ridges and grooves would have. The attorney will use these words in dependent claim 13, which is not important for now. So that's the end of claim one. You can see how many elements are required for infringement of this simple mechanical patent. That's why it's hard for anyone to do a patent infringement analysis in their head. It's a lot easier to do a trademark or copyright infringement analysis off the top of your head. Now that we understand the claims, let's look at a few devices and see if they infringe. The first device is a belt buckle opener. This does not infringe because there is no hollow circular member with ridges and grooves for engaging a cap. Further, the band is not a wristband as required by the claim. The second is closer. It is a wrist-mounted device. However, it does not have the hollow circular member with ridges and grooves for engaging a cap. The third also does not infringe. It has a hollow circular member with ridges and grooves to engage the cap. However, note that it is not designed as a wristband. Instead, it is placed around the palm. Note also that the preamble says, wearing on a wrist and a hand. However, the claim continues on, and it's required to actually encircle a wrist. 
Attorneys might argue that users might put it around their wrists, but the manufacturer will say that it's not designed that way. So there you have it, the basics of reading a patent, the claim, and figuring out infringement. One last thing. A dependent claim depends from an independent claim. To infringe a dependent claim, the device has to have all the claim elements of the independent claim and the dependent claim. The patent owner does not get more money if a dependent claim is also infringed. You don't infringe a patent twice. Instead, dependent claims are there for a legal reason that is not too important at this stage. Let me just say that dependent claims are mainly used to avoid having the patent claim later invalidated based on someone's prior art that was not known at the time the patent issued. In short, look at each of the dependent claims of a patent. In this patent, there was only one. In practice, many patents have at least four or five independent claims that need to be read. If none of the independent claims are infringed, then the patent is not infringed. If you are trying to obtain a patent, focus on what claim elements a potential infringer might drop out and still use your invention. If you are having a patent assert against you, Focus on what elements are missing in your device, or whether you can redesign your device and not have them. Last but not least, remember, if you at least look at patent claims before making any judgments about infringement, you'll at least look good. In the popular press, when people talk about patent infringement, it appears that they are just bluffing about what a particular patent covers. At times, it appears that the commentators are reading the title of a patent, or looking at a few figures and guessing at what might infringe. That's not how it's done. Patents are all about the claims. Start there, and you'll be on the right track. I hope this was helpful, and thanks for watching.